Welcome to this week's uh, Enoam discussion session. We are November 14th, 2021, 11 years into studying the Torah together on, in Enoam under this uh, organization or this title, I guess you can call it. And um, we're, uh, for those of you who are joining us online and maybe some new people who are going to watch this video later, uh, we uh, are a collection of Christians and Jews from around the world studying the Bible together. And uh, one of the things that unites us so that we can do this together is that we uh, believe that the Bible, the Hebrew Scriptures, uh, are the Word of God. And we also love and support Israel, and we're so glad that we can get together with our Israeli friends here uh, who are Jewish, who study the Torah every week in their community, and we can partake and join with them and learn a little bit from uh, how they study. And hopefully we uh, can have an exchange together, you know, um, because... This brings me into, you know, there are differences between Christians and Jews. Theologically, there are some big topics, some big things we call elephants in the room, you know, enom, that uh, sometimes we're glad, <laughs> thank you, Jocelyn, sometimes we're glad to address those, but we always uh, expect that it's done in gentleness, love, and respect, understanding that some people, uh, you know, don't want to receive forceful, pushy um, conversion agenda discussions about the Bible. So, that's just a kind of a baseline of, of respect and honor that we give each other when we talk about the Bible. And uh, so today we're going to be looking at this week's Parsha reading, which I'm going to share to the screen now. <clears throat> and we're looking at uh, Genesis chapter 28 to 32. And uh, just the general breakdown of our meeting today, uh, it's kind of, we sort of standardize in this model. So it's not going to be very different from the last couple weeks where we're going to spend about 15 minutes now. 10 to 15 minutes talking about introducing the topic and the themes in this reading. And then we're going to do a half hour breakout Hebrewist study where we're going to have groups of, looks like about four today, uh, just judging by the number of people. We could adjust that if a bunch of people come on in the next 10 minutes. But um, we'll, yeah, small groups of four. And we'll discuss the reading and the questions together, drawing from some of the slides here. And uh, then we'll come back together and share some concluding thoughts, ideas together. And, uh, yeah, I think with that, I'm going to ask, yeah, I don't know if it was you or Dean who came up with some of these questions in this week. I don't remember. Uh, it's my, my, my apologies. Were these, are these yours? Yes, yes. Okay. So maybe can you just intro us with a little bit of your, couple of your thoughts as we just start to get into the topic today? Sure. sure. First of all, I, I think that uh, this week's Parsha is, uh, so much about what we're doing here together. Um, it's all about family. Um, Israel is a family, and the greater Israel um, is, of course, a much larger family. And the greater Israel, of course, is the family of Abraham. Um, in this case, in the story here, we might even see that somewhat in, in Laban, who is, uh, even at the end of the story, we some, some interesting developments happen. Uh, between Jacob and Laban. And of course, in the coming weeks, we'll see Jacob and, and Esau. And we know Ishmael from the past. So there, there are really uh, uh, a, a, a family of Israel. There's a family of the greater Israel. And in this, as we can see in the story here, there's so many challenges. Um, it's not new. I mean, we know this from the very beginning of Genesis, how difficult it seems to be to even have... Uh, siblings that aren't willing to kill each other. Um, we see throughout the Bible a lot of challenges when it comes to trying to create nice, healthy families with fellowship. Uh, we feel so blessed that we know so many families like that today. Um, so I think we've made progress. But I think we have to realize that there are fundamentally uh, challenging obstacles to achieving this. And what I find so fascinating in this story is not only seeing the challenges, but also seeing how God actually helps and intervenes in helping cultivate this sense of family, not just amongst the children of Jacob, but also at a, at a, at a, at a higher level. Um, things that I would like to suggest that you look for when we look for how God actually contributes to the story, because... If you read the story itself, it may seem to be you don't necessarily see God in that story. 
I think that if we look carefully, we will actually see at least three themes that appear throughout this story. First of all, if you're not aware of this, the Torah actually has breaks in it. If you've ever seen the scrolls themselves, there are breaks. This entire parsha is one story. There's no breaks in the story. It's almost like as if it's a, it's, it's a unit unto itself, which means that the beginning, the end, and the middle are very, very important, as in almost any story. What I find really fascinating is that there are three things that appear in the beginning, in the end, and also in the middle. And those three themes are, let me see, anybody have any ideas? What themes appear beginning and then in the middle? I'll help you out. Thank you. One, one, anybody suggesting something? Okay. There's one word that appears 10 times throughout this parsha, even though it barely appears in the Bible. That word is Eben. It is stone. It appears in the beginning. It appears in the end. It appears in the middle. And the stones that appear in the story play very interesting roles. Another theme that appears in the beginning and the end and the middle is dreams. It's fascinating to see the role of the dream in this story and how it helps cultivate this family. The dream in the beginning, of course, is with a ladder. The dream at the end is Laban dreaming. The dream in the middle is Jacob having a dream with a, an angel speaking to him, telling him it's time to go home. Interestingly enough, just prior to that, that appears on 31.13. On 31.3, Hashem actually speaks to Jacob directly and tells him it's time to go home. Was that in a dream or was it in a dream? Very interesting question. Does God speak to us through dreams or not? If anybody has any questions, you might look to the story in Numbers with Miriam. When God admonishes Miriam for saying anything about Moshe. And what it talks about dreams. So we see dreams playing a very, very important role in the story. Extremely crucial role in the story. We also see another theme, the angels themselves. They appear in the beginning, going up and down the ladder. They appear in the end. And they appear in the, in the middle, like we said before about the dreams. So we have these amazing themes. If you look at the Hebrew of these three themes, what does Evan mean? What, what word do you find in Evan? You find building, leave note, you also find sun. When you think about Hanon, a dream, it also has melach in it, it has other meanings to it. Very interesting to look at the Hebrew and how they might have an impact here. Or if we're talking about the malach, it also has melech, kingdom. Bottom line, I'm Throwing in just these three things in order to try to see, perhaps in your discussions, how does God and man, together with God, in this story, through these three things, and perhaps in other ways, actually help us build a family, both in the level of Israel, Jacob, and as well as in the greater Israel context, with love them. What are the roles of these three themes in cultivating that family? And if we can think about today, how do these three themes also play into our, ne our need today to build that family, to build that Israel, to build like greater Israel? Because that is the way that God has chosen to become the king over all of humanity. And it is through this family that we have to cultivate, that we have to rebuild, that we that, that God wants to achieve this purpose. So this is just an introduction to some, I think, very fascinating insights we might come across as we start contemplating these questions of what are the what are the challenges facing us when we try to bring a family together?
certainly a family of 12 tribes. How does Hashem keep his promises in Jacob's story? Or as a family from the nations, what's, what, how, how does Laban have to improve in order to be able to create that greater Israel, in order to be able to create a stronger family, not just within each nation, but all of the nations together? And what can we learn, Israel and the nations, from this story today? I brought a few of sources. And some of the questions there might contribute to the discussion, but feel free completely to go beyond these these three stories to the entire Parsha, which, like I said, is really one story, starting with the ladder and the dream, ending with Jacob returning to the land and him seeing this camp of angels and all that happens in between with the with with his marriage, with the, the children and what happens between him and Laban. These are all fascinating subjects and I'm sure we'll all enjoy discussing the family aspects in the, in, in the breakout rooms. Wonderful. Th thank you, Mayor. So if we're ready, Kim, I think we can, uh, I'm not, yeah, Kim, I think you're the one doing it today. Uh, if we can break out into the breakout rooms, let's see, we have about 15 people. You wanna do three or four? I think we should do four per room. Four. And there, there will be one group of three. Okay. Here we go. There, then we don't have to look at other screens. Uh, Gabriel, how are you doing? I'm doing quite well. I'm a little bit concerned for our brother David. He's just about to be trampled by a flock of elephants. <laughs> are you serious? <laughs> look at his Whoa. photo. <laughs> I know. Well, speak, speak I thought the this. same thing when I saw him come out like that. I was like, whoa, David. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's Gabriel who keeps saying, uh, speaking about elephants in the room. So there you are. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Oh, I see. Love it. Oh. Yeah, you're Not good. only he brought one, he brought three. <laughs> yeah, it's all, it's all I love that. Elephants. I love. So this is the beginning, the middle, and the end. And the end. <laughs> so, Those elephants look great. <laughs> yeah. I'm only worried when there are Greeks riding the elephants. That's when they're dangerous. <laughs> A little historical reference there. So we uh, probably have about 15 minutes here. We can um, maybe share some ideas, like the big ideas that might have come up in your groups that stand out to you. Does anybody want to volunteer to start sharing something that stood out in your group as you were discussing? Well, um, I'll share one thing from our group, which was that uh, Laban's Motivation always seems to be, at least until the very end, is to take everything that belongs to Jacob and keep it for himself. And if he represents the Gentile nations, um, it speaks of him not recognizing his place as a Gentile in relation to Israel and attributing um, all of the blessings to himself, which is a familiar refrain when you think about things like replacement theology. And how we have to look at our own situation and ask ourselves, what is our role? And how can we fulfill it without taking things that belong to someone else, to, to belong to the role of other people? And the thing I was thinking about just as we were shutting down is that his name means white. And yet he seemed to be the guy who was doing all the deception in this Parsha. That's, That's an interesting uh, statement. So, on the heels of that, anybody else? Well, I think we looked at what Yair also said about uh, the the fact that Evan uh, is from the root bana, which is to build, and and uh, to rebuild, rebuild, establish. And here Yaakov is putting his head on the stone and he has the, the message of the angels up and down and Hashem is at the top speaking to him 
about the fact that I'm going to establish the covenant I made with Avraham Yitzchak, with you, Yaakov, I'm going to establish the covenant. And here his head is connected to the stone. I'm going to build you. I'm going to establish you. And then the other thing that we noted about, uh, about that, that uh, it just went out of my mind. I can't remember what I was going to say. Anyway, that was the one thing. Well, don't don't give up. Just get it. Uh, you're welcome to get it back when you get it. Let us know. <clears throat> Anybody else? Yeah, uh, yes, I'll, I'll share something which uh, Christine shared, which really captured my attention, and that is how Jacob makes, in a way, makes Alia a condition for his worshiping God because he said if God will be with me and keep me in this way that I'm going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace then the Lord shall be my God so we see their concept of oh. Aliyah returning back to the land and eventually to God. Yeah, that stood out. Thank you, Christine. Yeah, and, uh, good work. Yeah. yeah, Edward and and I, we were in the same breakout room, and that that theme definitely stood out for me as well. Is this idea that uh, returning to the Father's house is, in a way, it's a part of returning to the covenant that keeps the Father's house, and uh, the other dovetail on that that I really like is that you see when God speaks to the patriarchs to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob it's the promise interestingly enough is not only for them it's also that all the families of the earth shall be blessed so it's like there's always yes there's definitely great blessing specifically for Abraham specifically for Isaac specifically for Jacob and Jacob's you know descendants but yet there's always this little kind of like tucked in the sides like and all the families of the earth will be blessed through you, you know? So it's interesting. It's just like, it, it's just, it's part. So anyway, the, the Aliyah, the returning to the father's house, the, the accomplishment of the, of the covenant is also a benefit to everyone around the family, which is a really cool, you know, it's a really cool, um, dimension. Well, what you're saying basically is that the blessing that we seek must not be self-serving. Right. It has to be a blessing for others. Mm -hmm. And we have to serve as a channel. At Sino, in Hebrew, it's actually, there's a nice play on the word ratzon. Ratzon means will. We have to will that we become a Sino, which is the same letters. A Sino was a pipe. We want to become a pipe of blessing to the world. So, which means that basically, we want to be blessed so that we can bless the world. Whatever we God gives us should be given. Like we say, we should love God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our might. The might is that all the blessing that we have should be there in order to love God by bringing blessing to the rest of the world with whatever gifts God has given us. Beautiful. Beautiful. Very nice. Anyone else have any any thoughts to share? I think Bordis does, and I think that's Edward said it. That's I remembered what it was, and Edward said it had to do with Jacob. In that passage is very interesting because you really see Hebrew thought, block logic, very different than Greek thought. You have a divine perspective that is being dealt with when God is talking to Yaakov about what's going to happen. This is all about covenant. I'm going to establish you. I'm going to build you. And then you have Yaakov. He's like, I don't know about all that covenant stuff. Right. <laughs> I just know that Esau wants to kill me and you got to protect me and feed me and clothe me and, and bring me back. <laughs> and so you really got the human perspective and the divine perspective on an issue. And how do you, 
how do you, uh, what can you understand from that perspective? And I think Edward brought out and in, in your group brought out a really beautiful understanding uh, in, the, in the process of that. You know, I, in a way, Jacob felt like he was stuck between a killer and a crook. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. All right, Fortis, yes. Yeah, Fortis, look yeah, like you had some. That that was that was pretty much um, it. What Kim said it was it was about Jacob's interpretation of what God had already promised, and he's his interpretation was so finite in relationship to what God is saying. I'm giving you the universe, and he's looking at this thing like, well, you know what? If I can just have this little cave over here, and you'll do this, and you'll do that, that'll that'll suit me just fine. You know, I'm good with that. But he's missing the big picture. And I think we all, we tend to put God in this box that says, you know, we're not, we're, I'm not, I'm not really interested in, in all that other fancy stuff that you're talking about because I can't comprehend it. You know, what, the, what does, what does my name and, uh, and all the nations and um, everybody, uh, the nations being so large, it, it's numbered like the sands of the earth. What does that even mean? But, but I know I need food, but I know I need clothing, but I know I need shelter. But what, what Jacob fails to understand is that what, he what God just promised him includes all of those things. Mm. You know, the really interesting aspects of what you've just said is, and this is a little promo for next week, is that in the beginning of next week, a huge transformation occurs in Jacob's consciousness when his name is changed or he is promised that his name will change. Suddenly he starts to realize that it's more than survival, that there's something here that he has to take on to fulfill the name of Israel, which has enormous meaning to it, just in the name itself. And we'll of course talk about this next week, but you're right that right now he's just trying to figure out how to survive. And I'm afraid, Looking back at today, that when when we as a nation started to come back to Israel, we were very much in that survival mode. And it's only now that I think we begin to see more and more Jews in Israel. And, and those that are in the exile can't really do that. But those that are in Israel begin to realize, hey, God actually gave us a, a job to do. We've got a really important job to bring blessing to the entire world. And we have to stop fearing so much about our survival and start thinking much more about how we fulfill our purpose. And th this is just beginning now, and it's a very exciting period to live in that. Hmm. Very true. And you know, there's a, I mentioned to our group too, about the, the aspect of hope. Um, when, when we recognize that God chose Abraham, and we read it in Genesis 18, because uh, and chose him because he knew he could direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. Um, don't you have hope now when you see uh, Abraham's kid, Isaac, uh, and you see uh, his kid, Jacob, and Esau? Uh, when you watch this three-generational family and you see all this incredible uh dysfunction it gives us all hope okay that god could work through as much dysfunction as there to somebody he said that he already knew that he could direct and look after his kids okay and that you know because you look at this and you go this abraham must be super abraham okay super abe because he knows how to look after family but he's got problems in the first generation let alone in the grandkids uh, so, so, so doesn't that give us some form of hope, whether we're Jew or not Jew? For sure. You're saying we don't have to be perfect, Dean? Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> no, I, I, I just got a license to fail. <laughs> <laughs> well, Isaiah 55. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts aren't your thoughts. Mine has so much more power into it, right? So let's focus on his ways and his thoughts. That's what I'm left with. Mm -hmm. 
First time I looked at DNA, I realized these thoughts aren't my thoughts. (laughs) That's interesting what Dean just said, because that did come up in our our conversation, that whole issue of failing. And, And once again, it's very interesting that in Hebrew thought, failure, failure is not even an issue with God. God is far more concerned with an outcome regarding you and your relationship with him. And he, he is, it's just so interesting that he doesn't look at failure like we look at failure, you know, like, oh God, I failed. That's why he could say, uh, you know, you're going to fall seven times, but you're going to rise again. Because for God, failure is a stepping stone for where he's bringing you to. We see failure, but I don't think God really sees the same type of, well, I don't think God sees what we see. I no, think he values he effort. And he also looks at purpose. He, he is looking at purpose while we're focused on Oh my God, I just failed. I I blew it. I'm done. It's all over. And God's like, well, procrastination. I think, that, I think that that ladder that this Parsha opens up it means so much because basically the ladder is saying that we have to climb. We have to climb and we have to climb very, very high. And if you think that just climbing up the ladder is an easy task, of course it isn't. It's an extremely difficult task. And it will entail also failure, but you will learn. And you may even drop a rung every every once in a while, and you will have to climb back up again. But you will ultimately reach the heavens, and you will ultimately bridge the earth with the heavens. And I think that's, the, by the way, the beauty of the monument, of the stones that we mentioned earlier. It's almost like we see in this week's Parsha how man imbues into the stone spirituality, things of meaning. For example, they, first of all, he says, I'm going to build a house of God from these stones, right? Creating a place where God's presence is felt in the world. or Jacob, looking at that stone which was put on the well, meaning that certain people were keeping the water for themselves and they were trying to create a situation where only they could actually use the water. And until they all came together, they wouldn't be able to drink from the water. And Jacob said, what kind of nonsense is that? Everybody should be able to drink from this well, right? Everybody that passes by. This is, we have to open up the waters for everyone, whether that water is drinkable or whether it's spirituality or Torah, we have to we have to welcome everyone to drink from these wells. And that's what he does. And he has this suddenly enormous strength in order to be able to do it. Or if he wants to make an impression on this Rachel that walks out, you know, is walking up to them and suddenly he's driven, he's able to lift, you know, a rock that only a whole bunch of shepherds were able to pick up. Again, the power of love, the power of, 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 of aspiring to, to something greater or the monument that is established by Laban and Jacob at the end, even though they didn't really see eye to eye and even they use different names for the same rock. But by God, that rock is a monument and it's established to say, you know what? We might not agree on everything, but at least let's take upon ourselves not to cross the borders of the other and not to harm or bring harm to the other. So there are ways of taking the material world, which the rocks really represent, and to give them purpose and give them meaning that ultimately enables us to come together more and more as a family. I think that's 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 part of um, what I what, what we can, what we found when we studied the parsha on Shabbat. Um, the angels. The we said there are two other things. The, the angel theme and the dream thing. I, I got to tell you a story, if it's okay. I don't know. I hope that we're, if we're pressed for time, you know, we can really make. Uh, uh, my, my daughter, Rachel, came to us for Shabbat, and she forgot her phone on the bus. 
which is, of course, a bit, you know, upsetting. Uh, the bus continued. I picked her up minutes before Shabbat. So obviously during Shabbat, we couldn't find out what, where that phone ended up. And so after Shabbat, I took her down to Tiberias. And we went down looking for a bus driver to ask, you know, what would a bus driver do if he found it on the bus? Or how can we go about it? And we found out the information. And then Rachel got on a bus. And on the way to the bus, she was going back to Jerusalem. She suddenly sees a woman come over to her and ask her, tell me, um, could I possibly use your Ravka, that is your, 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 uh, um, what is it? It's kind of like, um, it's, it's like a, uh, a subway thing where you have a certain number of rides. Could I use yours? I'll pay you. And Rachel looks at that woman and she says, of course you can. But weren't you on the bus on Friday on the way to Tiberias? She says, yeah, I was on the bus on Friday on the way to Tiberias. She says, do you happen to know how we could get in touch with the, with the driver of the bus? And she says, yeah, it just so happens I have the bus driver's number because I asked a question and he gave me the, and he gave me the number. And on the spot, she calls up the bus driver. And the bus driver tells her, yeah, I found the phone and I put it here and here and you can go at six o'clock in the morning and pick it up. And my daughter, uh, all this happened within minutes of her getting on the bus. So she was able to get off the bus so that she could come back home so that she'd be able to pick it up on Tiberius. And as she got off, she said, oh, my goodness, I don't have a phone. How am I going to call anybody to pick me up in the in the in, in the and so somebody from our community just happened to pass by, saw her, picked her up, took her off the phone. And I was thinking about all of these angels in this Parsha, how they all of a sudden show up and somehow everything comes together. It just, you know, so so when when Jacob at the end of the Parsha, when he says he sees a camp of angels and he calls the place Machanaim, which means plural camps, he's basically coming to the recognition that in this world, we are not alone. We are really, along with our human camps, we also have camps of messengers of God. And some of them might be more spiritual, some of them might be human, but we are never alone. And God is somehow working through all of this, and including he's connecting with us in our dreams, and that's a subject we can start talking about a lot in the next portions, because we're just gonna see more and more dreams. But it's just amazing how God is able to send messengers and to communicate with us and to do everything that's necessary. So with us, so that we human beings, with all of our limitations and with all of our failures, can continue to learn and grow and climb up that ladder to a degree that enables us to ultimately fulfill our purpose in this world. And that's what I took away from the portion. It's good. That's beautiful. Good. And beautiful story. Beautiful. That's an awesome story. Absolutely. I bet that awesome. I bet Rachel's really encouraged. <laughs> it's like, oh, Hashem is with me. <laughs> the truth is that it, Hashem is with all of us. This is really the amazing thing. There is actually a book called Bala Sulam, The Master of the Ladder which talks about all of these things, about the ladder and climbing up the ladder. And one of the major messages that I received when I studied that book was that God is always there and he's always shining his light upon us. The question is, are we facing the light or are we turning our back on the light? Oh, so okay. we might find ourselves in, in dark. It's all our own doing. What we have to do is we have to start turning around and aligning ourselves with God's light. And we will suddenly find that he is really there with us, not to do the work instead of us, but to help us do the work so that we can ultimately climb up that ladder and even become one of his messengers in this world to, for others and become that channel of blessing to the entire world. And that's why the blessing that Abraham receives is not a blessing. Okay, it's going to be great for you. I don't care about anybody else.
else. That's not what God is telling him. He's saying, I want you to bring up a family. I want you to bring up a family which is going to truly commit to passing on God's teaching, God's ways from one generation to the next until you figure it out and until you actually do it to such a degree that this will become a light to all nations. All nations should be able to climb up that ladder and all nations should be able to receive that blessing. And part of climbing that ladder is recognizing that the gifts that God has given us is for everyone. It's for us to bring blessing to the entire world. And then you have a completely different relationship. Instead of the relationship between Israel and the nations being a competitive one, a sense like we saw the children of Laban saying, oh my goodness, everything that Jacob has comes from, from, from our father, right? He, everything was from us and he's, and, and he's taking it all away. Um, we've seen so much of that in history. And the whole point really is that more and more countries are trying to get some of the Jews to come back into exile because they realize that so much of the blessing, just like Laban says, so much of the blessing he realized came from Jacob because God blessed him. So if we can understand that God's teaching through Israel is a blessing to all nations and that the whole purpose of all this is really to bring a blessing to all nations, then the relationship between the Muslim nations has to be much more uh, a relationship of love because we really care about each other and we love each other. We want, to, we want to make sure that Israel is able to fulfill its role as a priestly nation and that Israel can help bring the light of God to the entire world by learning how to follow in his ways and to create a really strong and healthy family that is capable of bringing blessing to the entire world. That's it's a different, it's, it's the, that's the kind of relationship that God seeks for us. And I, I believe that what we're trying to do here in the Enoam is try to learn how to do that. Well, let's all uh, pray that the Lord will answer that prayer, perhaps an indirect one, but that we would be able to learn exactly that, how to walk in his ways, how to bring that love. Right, Dean? Good. 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 <laughs> so I think with that, we're going to wrap up today. I wish all of you a great week. Shavuot Tov. And we will be back together next week. Thank you. Thank you. Shavuot Tov, everyone. everyone. Have, Have a good, good week. week. Shavuot Tov. Good to see you all. Shavuot Tov. Good to see you Yes. Remember, God loves you and me too. Bye. Bye. Bye.